You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, The Voice, Jeff Tucker. When you watch all of those high school movies, those John Hughes movies, those screwball teen comedies where everybody's trying to get laid over and over again and blah, 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 blah. They paint this picture of high school that's just not accurate at all, not even close. And for a guy like me who spent his whole life watching movies, high school was a blast of cold water. Uh, It was not anything that I expected it would be, and it would take years for me to figure out. It was a puzzle to figure out, and it would take years to figure out how that puzzle worked and how to make it work for me. This is the second episode of the high school series. I did eighth grade. That was a tough one because, like I said in that episode, we didn't have middle school. There was no junior high Uh, When I went to school, there were budget cuts and I was in a really short window where you went from elementary school, seventh grade to high school in eighth grade. And I wasn't ready for it. I needed middle school. Now, I've I've got two two teenage kids uh, and a third one on, uh, you know, she's on the cusp. She's 12. And I know that middle school was the hardest for the first two. And. Well, no, she's in middle school now. It's the, it, She's not having a good time of it. Middle school's tough. It's that weird in-between. But the tough part about middle school is that there are these older kids there who know how the system works. They're older. They've gone through, you know, mega puberty. They've got a beard. And they just pummel you with the with this platform of they know more than you do. Well, that's middle school. Imagine eighth grade and you're in there with seniors like these guys had beards cars some of them had wives like i don't even know how to deal with any of this so when eighth grade ended like it was a relief like i oh my god it was like being paroled from prison and having the whole summer to rejuvenate and reconfigure and try to figure out how to make this work because you're caught right in the middle between being a child and being forcefully pulled into not adulthood but teenagehood if that makes sense you know it's only after we've gone through it do we realize there's two stages you don't you don't become an adult you become this teenager this rebellious easy to anger, full of emotion, like you're just a whirlpool of emotion teenager, and you have to get through that. You have to figure a way to get through it. You've ever seen Star Trek 3, and there's a geeky reference for you. Spock goes through it on the Genesis planet, and you're like, there's high school right there, because he's like, oh, he's shaking, and you know, and Savick is like, he's going through Pong Far. Like, no, he's going through high school, okay? And he's not going to make it. So eighth grade summer was like, oh, oh, my God, get me out. I wasn't used to like the school days were longer. The teachers are more intense. They expect more. And you have to figure out, like I said in the first episode, you have to figure out how to gain the system, what teachers were paying attention, which ones weren't, that sort of thing. And so that summer, you know, I'm still I was still this idiot star wars kid and star wars at this point is we're now um it's early summer 1985 star wars is a year and a half out it's dead you know it's over there's no nothing on the horizon except horrible ewok movies star wars is gone 
So that that thing I had my entire adolescence now leaves me. And I think I was searching for something else. And most kids, most normal kids, find music. My wife got into prints at that age. Everything she had was purple. I've seen pictures. I never got into music that way. I liked a little bit of here and there, you know, but I didn't like turn on the radio and, and it just wasn't me. I had a I had that beta player and I watched movies and I taped movies off television and I watched them or I taped late uh, you know late night with David Letterman or I, I would tape magician specials like Penn and Teller or David Copperfield then I would watch it frame by frame to f- see how it was done like n- this is not stuff that makes you endearing to women to girls it was all girl kryptonite everything i everything i was involved with was girl kryptonite but you don't know that at the time you just are trying to get through the days you know, and this is right. Oh, imagine this is right at the time when my mother moved in Don Berg to our house. And I'll refer you to the Berg episodes where my life at home became a living nightmare where every day this guy would try to pick a fight with me. And I wasn't I wasn't prepared for it. It took it took a while for me to get my armor you know, you face an enemy long enough, you get armor. And I had to get my armor, but I didn't have it. So midway through that summer, my brother took me to the movies. I, I had planned on seeing a bunch of movies that summer. Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Goonies, Explorers. Um, there was another one called Enemy Mine that was uh, on the horizon. All things I had seen in Starlog. But Jimmy, my brother, took me to see this film called Back to the Future. Uh, I didn't know what it was about. I had not seen a commercial. I went in completely blind. I didn't want to go. And like, if you know me, you know, like something switched in my brain. And there's something about that movie that just locked in. I mean, I wrote a book about that movie called Your Friend in Time. It's on Amazon where I go in detail of what that movie means to me. And there was no going back after that. I saw Back to the Future that summer over 50 times in the theater i went day after day after day and my mother could see like this is something he needs and if you know you i could ride my bike from norwalk to lakewood mall it would take about an hour go straight up studebaker turn right on uh delamo and you're there or candlewood and uh i saw it was only about three bucks like it wasn't a lot of money you know, God bless my mother gave me money to do stuff because eventually Back to the Future ended up in the um, Alondra 6, which was $1.50. And I saw it a lot of times there the whole summer. I just, I became fascinated. Like just, I loved and still do love this movie. And it would take a lifetime of experience to figure out why. And the why is simply Marty McFly is not happy with his life and through the actions of the film he changes his life for the better and i think subconsciously i dreamed of that i wanted to change my life i wanted to become something more than i was because what i was at age 14 i turned 14 right before school started my birthday is september 10th so it was normally right around the first week of school so i turned 14 and I've got pictures from that era. I, I'm a complete wreck. I look like, I don't even know, I look like a mess. Like I look like 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 a hobo. Like I look like somebody who just does not have any care for his appearance. It didn't even occur to me that, you know, to get a girlfriend, to get a girl interested in you, it's 99% taking care of your look, right? Not even a clue. The... You know, they, they take your yearbook picture at the beginning of the year. So at the end of the year, when you get the yearbook and you finally have, you know, refined how you want to look. Oh, there's a reminder of the first week. I looked like hell. So I, I looked I looked so bad going into ninth grade. But the good news was we had a name. We were the freshmen. I was a freshman. Finally, I was no longer an eighth grader. Not only was I a freshman. But 
there were people under me. So I was no longer the low man on the totem pole. Now, I was height-wise, but not grade-wise. So I entered back at Norwalk High um, with a little bit of direction, a little bit. Like, I knew that I wanted to be in drama. The accident that happened putting me in drama in eighth grade stuck. And drama became my sixth period salvation. And the rest of the day was just, just get through it. Just get through it. You know, I was very smart, so I took advanced math and fought with my teachers every step of the way on that because you have to show your work, Tucker. Yeah, I know. Let me let me scribble some numbers on the side here, and you'll think I've shown my work. You know, I took uh, social studies, history, all this, all this, the normals. You know, all this, all it's all the same teachers. You know, there's these teachers that rotate around the electives. And you hear about them. So when you finally land in one of their electives, then your life changes. You, you, not your life changes, but you go, oh, okay, this is a different flavor of high school. Now, my mother insisted that I take typing as an elective. I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to take typing. It seemed, it seemed boring, to tell you the truth, when there were other more exciting electives, right? But... I took typing. The teacher's name was Mr. Ferry. I mean, imagine that poor man going through life as Mr. Ferry. I mean, it, Tucker's bad enough. Ferry's pretty bad. But he, he had a high-pitched voice, and he would say, Okay, today we'll be working on the S, the D, and the F keys. And he shook and he sweated when he was up in front of us. He was so nervous. And then, like, he only had to speak for the first five minutes of class to tell us what the assignment was. And the rest of the hour was just clack, 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 clack on these giant IBM typewriters. And once you, you know, the first couple of weeks, once you learn how to load the typewriter, once you learn how to get the paper exactly where you want it, uh, then you can begin to learn how to type. And... There's no uh, no correction tape uh, in this class. You make a mistake, it's there for him to see. So I took typing, and I, I got really good at it. It was a skill that I picked up pretty easily. The only bad part was I would spend all day in school listening to teachers talk, and on the desk, I would be typing it out on an invisible typewriter. I would be going through the letters with my fingers. And I got really good at it. I ended up taking, I think, two years of typing. And the interesting part is, elective-wise, this was the class that has stayed with me the longest. I mean, how weird is that? That Mr. Ferry teaching me typing has stayed with me until today. I can type incredibly fast. When I sit down, and, it, and up until, a, you know, like, what, five years ago, where I work, we still had the, we still had typewriters. So I would load the paper in, and, uh, you know, when you had to do, like, a, like a, fill out a form. Most of them are forms before they put everything online. And I would sit there and clack, 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 and people would just look at me like I was crazy because most younger people, they've never used a typewriter. They wouldn't even know the first step. You know, and the humming and the uh, the all that when you're doing it, it's totally alien to them because they've got laptops and computers and now it's all smartphones, right? You have to do anything on anything but your phone at this point. But back then, I mean, it, it sounds like, my God, it sounds like the 50s, right? Like it was so long ago that they taught me the typewriter the keys, the motions, the strokes, because I was going to need this the rest of my life. Now, I do use it. Like I said, I'm a very fast ty uh, typist. I, there's no way to write a novel. I've written uh, five of them. There's no way to write a novel without being a fast typist. You don't, you don't want to hut and peck. You'll be there forever. You know, My novels are 500 pages long. So that was my elective for ninth grade. The other one being drama. I mean, it was always drama. No matter how many electives we were allowed, uh, drama was always one of them because 
Drama was the only class I felt like I belonged in. You know, everybody was an outcast. We had we had some very attractive girls in there. Um, but, you know, they, they dated outside the drama pool. We were just lucky uh, to be in the same room with them. You know, and, and for young guys, that's all we need. Oh, there's a pretty girl. I'll just, this is great. I'm in the presence of a pretty girl. Rock and roll. Uh, but there was no dating. There was no dating. Now, it was in the... In the, the the ninth grade year that I just you know I tried earnestly to date someone. There was a girl that I had been in elementary school with, who you know came over to the same high school. Her name was uh, Jenny. I'm not going to give the last name. I don't want to embarrass her or me. Uh, like like I'm in, yeah, I, I can be embarrassed. But uh, this girl Jenny, I thought, oh, I'm going to date her. She you know she's about my speed she's not overly pretty she's just i mean what does albert brooks say in defending your life you should be with someone who's just pretty enough to turn you on because anything extra is asking for trouble right and i wasn't going to go we had we had incredible lookers in our class girls who went on to actually become bona fide swimsuit models right but i you know i picked Jenny first the first girl I ever picked was Tammy God knows where she is today but I, you know this girl Jenny sat in front of me in math class and I had these illusions that I was going to date Jenny you know take her, I was gonna take her to the mall <laughs> so my back to the future fascination uh, steamrolled my life and eventually uh, this is, I mean, how do you even remember this? Don Berg's daughter, Debbie, Debbie Berg had a jacket, a lot like Marty's jacket. It was that acid washed blue jean with the darker patches. It wasn't perfect, but if you squinted, it was good enough. So I borrowed it. And from the thrift store, I got one of those, oh, those orange vests, which I have two or three now. And I actually went to school dressed as Marty McFly. I had the jacket, I had the vest, and I had the um, the film novelization by George Geip. It doesn't even have, like I, I got it bef- you know, right when the movie came out, so it didn't even have the poster on the front. It has a picture of Michael J. Fox. Eventually it would be released with the key art on it, but this is like an early version, right? And it's And it's based off an early version of the script, so it contains scenes that are not in the film i read this thing religiously that we didn't have youtube or this movie wouldn't come out on video cassette for a year after it was released this was the only way to you know to bring the movie home while it was still in theaters there's no merchandise no nothing this is it so i carried that to school nearly every day because there you know i would finish my school work early and then i would read and I read Back to the Future. And I'll never forget this girl, Jenny. She turned around from math. She, you know, She's either going to ask somebody behind me a question or something. She wasn't turning around to talk to me. And she looked at how I was dressed. And she looked at the, the, the cover of the book. And then she looked at me again. You know, and the realization is slowly dawning on her face. Right. She's the only one who's noticed this in the whole school day. And she just looked at me and she said, you effing F, meaning F word for gay people. You effing F. Like just like the disdain dripped from her mouth. You effing F. And I just, <laughs> what, what do you do? I was like, whatever. I, I, <laughs> And then, like, she's elbowing the people next to her, like, look at this dork. He's dressed up as the, the, the Back to the Future guy, you know, and everybody's looking at me, you know, they're looking at me like, you dork. And they're all right. I, you know, that's it's totally right. Um, but. Any hopes of dating Jenny at that point, I mean, just crashed to the ground. You know, she couldn't even look at me 
You know, <laughs> she couldn't. She couldn't even look at me, right? But, <laughs> but that's okay because I had drama, and in drama class, I had met guys that would become lifelong friends. You know, drama just there's something about doing a production together that cements you and forms a bond and it's hard to explain i mean i'm sure the 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 band has it i'm sure the football team has it and the drama team has it too you you're there at the school hour after hour after hour and you depend on these people you know they're going to give you your line your costume your prop the lights are going to change you just know it and that dependency is what brings you together and i met this guy david lewis and felipe who i've had on the show these are my i mean i still know these guys it's been 30 plus years and there's something about getting up on that stage and letting it all leaving it on the stage you know even at that young age of 14 and you just it it just it just it brings a fire in you and drama just did that for me and i was so thankful to be part of that experience and again i'm still i'm the low man on the totem pole because there's so many people above me in the drama world and i can't sing so they're doing musicals where they're casting me because I can act, I can emote, I can be funny. But they're not casting me because I can sing. They're, no, 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 no. So they decided to do Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat by Andrew Lloyd Webber, which is all music. I don't think there's any dialogue in it at all. It's like Les Mis. It's just music from cover to cover. But it has a big cast. So... Everybody who auditioned for it was going to make it in, which was a really cool thing because we don't want to leave anybody behind, especially not me. I was ready to go. Now, I had um, made an impression on not only the drama teacher, Maggie Regalado, but there were these two guys that came back after graduating to help Maggie in these productions, Tim Contreras and Dave Smith, and I idolized these guys. They were the coolest cats, man. They were into comic books and, you know, they knew music more than I did, which everybody did. And they knew drama. So they were helping direct this thing. And I was so happy to just soak in what they were telling me, right? And I think one of them had just done Joseph at, I want to say it was Buena Park. So me, David, and Felipe went out to Buena Park's Community Theater to watch that production before our production, and our production was a copy of their production, so it was like watching something before we did it, and that was very helpful. So I got cast in the play, which was great, and in, in Joseph, everybody plays multiple parts because Joseph has all these brothers, and then during the course of the play, there's a few standout parts, but mostly the brothers just fill in whoever Joseph is meeting. I played Zebulon. I have no idea. Zebulon. I even had my Z emblazoned overalls for years after. They're probably in a box somewhere in the garage. Uh, Martha's mother made all the costumes. I remember being fitted for a costume thinking, I've made it. They're fitting me for a costume. Uh, But little did I know, little did I know that (laughs) what they had planned for me for joseph and the amazing technicolor dream coat would be the ultimate test of how bad do you want to be in this production what what are you willing to do to be a part of the show now they had cast felipe to sing a song a solo felipe my friend felipe was going to sing a solo i was so in awe of that I wasn't jealous at all because I can't sing and I know I can't sing and I have no illusions of singing. On the other hand, Felipe could sing. So Felipe was asked to sing a solo called Potiphar. 
And the character of Potiphar is not the person singing. It's going to be this other guy. So they asked me to be Potiphar. So my friend Felipe was going to sing the song and I was going to represent Potiphar on the stage and act it out in front of everybody. So, of course, I said yes. I couldn't wait. And little did I know, little did I know what would be ahead of me. So let's listen to a little of Felipe singing Potiphar from Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat circa 1985. Yeah, that Felipe is pretty talented, isn't he? And he still is in production today. He still sings. So good for Felipe for keeping the Norwalk High Drama Club torch alive, man. But let's get to Potiphar himself. Potiphar himself is the guy who buys Joseph after his brother trades him into the slave trade. And Potiphar brings him home to be the maid and the, not the maid, the, the, the housekeeper. So they want me to be Potiphar. And I said, yes, of course, not knowing what the costume was going to be. So somewhere in a production, Potiphar had been translated as Charlie Chaplin. So I was to become a, a, an Egyptian version of Charlie Chaplin. So I had the bowler. I had the little mustache. And what I also had was a tiger miniskirt little tiger frillies that went around my ankles, uh, cuffs that went around my wrists, and a tuxedo jacket with no sleeves and no shirt. And I remember putting it on and going, I, I, I can't go out there like this. I, I can't show people that, I mean, this is 80% of my body revealed. I'm way too shy for this. And, I did a lot of soul searching thinking about that costume. And what if it what if the skirt falls off while I'm dancing because there was some dance moves involved in this thing? What if what if what if? You know, what if the I showed up at school naked nightmare becomes reality for me? And this was a turning point in my acting life. And my performance life. Because I remember telling myself, just do it. Who cares Who cares what the outcome is? Who cares what the consequences are? Live in the moment. I was 14. I was nervous about my body. I had barely gone through puberty. I weighed 109 pounds. I was 4 foot 11 And I was about to go on stage in front of girls that I had crushes on wearing nearly nothing. And I did it. And something in my brain went ping. And I don't, since that moment, since that moment of Potiphar in 1985, I don't get nervous on stage. I don't, it doesn't matter how many people are out there. It doesn't matter if I have a script or no script. It doesn't matter if somebody says, here's a microphone, go go talk to the audience for 10 minutes. It doesn't matter to me. I have no problem doing in that. Because in 1985, I figured out how to block that from my brain. How to block the nervousness, the embarrassment, the what if goes wrong, what if, what if, what, ooh, it's all gone. And yeah, that skirt threatened to fall every time. It, was, it wasn't It was a skirt. It was a piece of fabric held with a safety pin, you know? And I remember in, standing in the wings wearing it 
Well, everybody around me is rushing. You know, I've done my costume change. I'm ready to go. And like saying to myself, I'm really going to do this. I'm really going to walk out there like this and only walk out there, but stand stand center stage in the darkness. And when the music comes on, they will put a spotlight on me and I will be the only thing visible for a good three seconds. And I did it. I just, I just did it. And I look, I didn't cure cancer. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but for a performer, for a for a a nervous, lonely high school kid, it was a big deal. So, I thank Maggie and all you know Dave and Tim for that having that moment, moment in that play, you know. And so, the school year marched on, and the notable things are, I got out of PE. Like I I remember getting the uh, the little packet from the school and you know filling it out and telling my mom look I don't care what happens I am getting out of PE I can't do another day in it so they had this thing called individual sports and what it was was you you played badminton tennis archery this kind of thing and it was 99% girls. There was like three guys in the whole class. It was me and this guy, Toby, and some other guy, maybe Steve. And I got up. I didn't have to, I didn't have to run the, the track. You know, I didn't mind getting changed to play these games. You know, it was only an hour. And it's, it, it took a lot of the pressure off of having to live up to be something I wasn't and I wasn't an athlete in any way, shape or form. And the coaches there were so adamant that everybody was going to be an athlete because that's all they knew that to get out of that was like, okay, I, I can breathe a little easier. I'm not trapped in that nightmare anymore, but it's not like, it's not like they gave up on me, you know, Terry Van Gorder, uh, uh, whatever the, I don't, some of the, I don't remember a lot of the coaches names cause I wasn't in there that long, but I, just, you know, I had for other classes, but I remember, um, walking by them and they would go, you're not in class anymore. Tucker. No, I took individual sports. Uh, like getting judgment from them. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you guys, you, is this what you do? Is this part of your teaching mode? You do this? Just leave me alone. But that was, I mean, that wasn't how they acted. You know, it was a concentrated effort to make us all into, immediately make us all into men, you know. And I didn't, I didn't need their help. I didn't need, I was getting plenty of that at home with Berg. So I wasn't going to go to high school. You know, high school was my escape from Berg. So I wasn't going to go there and, and encounter, you know, Berg 2.0. Telling me I wasn't good enough. Telling me I was, uh, I was gay for not liking what they liked. You know these guys were brutal. These guys, these guys played psychological head games every day, and maybe that worked with their football teams. And I don't deny them at all. Football was important to our high school. I went to every football game. I supported. Now I didn't play. I wasn't going to shave my head and play. They would have killed me. I would have been dead. But man, the, the coaches were not nice people. You know, I'm sure that that attitude pushed the players to do their best. But those of us who were not interested in playing were treated just as mean by those guys. You know, and I wonder if they even noticed it. They probably had no clue. This was just the way it was done. This is how we make men. That's great, man. Make men. Just leave me alone. I'm going to go over here and play badminton with my shuttlecock. Please stop laughing at me. I got creative every other year after that taking PE. And we'll get to that in, you know, next year, next episode's sophomore year. But I... 
journeyed through ninth grade, just it's trying to get through it. You know, my mother asked if I wanted to buy the yearbook. She was willing to buy it. And I said, I don't want it. I don't want to remember any of this. So I actually don't have a ninth grade yearbook. I have 10, 11, 12. And I have an 84, which is before I even got there, but it features a lot of the people I know because I got that at a thrift store. But I wasn't interested in saving any of ninth grade except Joseph because that was such a positive, like changing experience with people that I trusted and admired. You know, David and Felipe became became guys I trusted, guys that were my friends. You know, I had more good times with those guys than anybody because we were all in the same boat. We were all trying to find ourselves in a place that wasn't interested in anything but pummeling us. And it wasn't until, it really wasn't until 10th grade that I figured things out. You know, it really wasn't. And 9th grade was just a wash, you know. The only highlights of, here's the, here are the highlights of ninth grade. I've, you know, Joseph, you know, and sometimes I don't have, you know, I don't have my, my report cards or anything. I'm sure they're in a box somewhere, but I can't differentiate some of the years and where the school year ends and where it begins and what class was took where, because I do know that I took a film class, stop motion film class taught by Mrs. Russell, the art teacher. And she would become infamous a few years later when a video service, early 90s, a video service of kids smoking pot in her room while she was completely oblivious. And when I attended, we knew that she had a back room full of booze and she would just tank up during class. And she was another one that had one of those shaky kind of you know, she sounded like uh, Catherine Hepburn. Today we'll be doing this in class. Like, oh my God. But hey, it was a film class. So I was all about it. And we were going to make a little stop motion movie. So of course I wanted to do a Back to the Future one starring Gumby. I did a Gumby as Marty McFly. I made a car. And I actually, no joke, in one of my boxes, I have that film. Like I really have that film with all the images intact it's pretty funny a little silent movie i made but the turning point of that year happened in that class and it happened uh i had a friend named james i don't know what happened to james james sort of moved away and vanished but for a really brief time james was a good friend of mine james was a big dude football player uh but but the most gentle guy you'd ever know and James' thing was, when he got on the football team, he had to shave his head. And one day he was walking home when the La Mirada punks pulled up. Now, we had gangs all over Norwalk. The La Mirada punks, you know, from La Mirada, were pretty infamous as being ruthless. And if they, I mean, if they got you alone, you were dead. So they, they confronted James because they thought he was a skinhead like they were. Because he'd shaved his head. And James told the story of them surrounding him and going, hey, man, you know, who are you with? Who are you with? Like, are you with this and this? And James had a split second to come up with a way to save his life. So James just looked at the lead and went, I know. And the lead guy went, oh, he's mentally challenged, dude. He's not in a gang. And they got it and they left him alone. They drove off. God, James told that story. We laughed so hard. He's like, no, man, it ain't funny. It saved my life. But James was a good dude. There's even a picture of James in that movie that I made. I took a single frame of James's face. But at the table, it was a table of four. It was me, James, some other dude. It might have been Toby. And then this guy, Rick. This guy named Rick Williams. Now, Rick Williams was a heavy metal guy. He's the guy in the green army jacket, right? And uh, Rick's a badass. Rick's bigger than anybody. Rick can pummel you. He's got longer hair. Rick just looks like if he decides you're dead, then you're dead. 
Now, I had gone to a convention, and I had spent a lot of money on a necklace, a claw necklace. It was a bird's claw made of brass holding a crystal. It's the nerdiest wizard necklace you could ever imagine. But it costs like 30 bucks. I'm not sure what we were thinking, but me and and Eric Hardy and another guy all decided this is what we're going to spend our money on. We're going to wear these when we play D&D and we'll all be part of the same, you know, the same the same clan, right? The same crusade. And so sometimes I would wear the necklace of school when we were going to play Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, one day Rick, dis- Rick asks, hey, man, can I see that necklace? And, you know, I, I'm not in a position to say no to Rick. You just either comply or you get pummeled. So I said, here, Rick, of course. And Rick looked at it and he put it around his neck and he went, thanks. And I, you know, there's a long moment. You know, it's Clint Eastwood. It's a uh, do do wah, wah, wah. And I look at the necklace and I look him in the eye and I go back to my work because he's bigger than me. He's got my necklace. It's gone. So that stewed for a couple of weeks. It didn't sit well, of course. I mean, I'd had my bike stolen at one point. That was pretty bad. I was going home to Berg every day. That was pretty bad. And now I've lost my Dungeons and Dragons necklace to this heavy metal guy. So I don't know what got into me. I don't know how this happened, but I approached Rick before class started. We're all waiting in between the buildings on the grass, waiting for Mrs. Russell to finish her drinky drink and open the door. And I went up to Rick and I said, you know, and I look, I mean, I look, I'm looking up. He's a good two feet taller than I am. And I said, you know, Rick, I don't care how big you are. I don't care how beat up I get or what happens. I want my effing necklace back now. And I don't care what happens at this point. And you know what? Rick looked at me. And he just shook his head. He was like, son of a bitch, Tucker, man. And he took the necklace off and he gave it back to me. And he goes, that's how you do it, man. That's how it's done. And I I didn't know what to do. And after that, Rick and I became really good friends. I mean, not hangout buddies, but certainly cordial. And my wife has a bunch of tattoos that Rick did because Rick became a pretty amazing tattoo artist. And every time she goes for the tattoo, he, he, you know, he tells that story. He's like, Tucker's the only dude ever stood up to me, man. And I just was like, I did it. I got my necklace back. <laughs> I, I can do anything. I can ask Jenny out. No, that's not going to happen. But I did. I did like this girl, Sarah. So I, I, I turned my attention to Sarah and, uh, Sarah and I became close to dating, almost dating, but not quite. Never took her to a restaurant, never took her to a movie. Uh, Me and Eric used to go and hang out at her house after school, uh, which was not close. I mean, she lived pretty far on the other side of town. She lived closer to the elementary school than she did the high school. And I closed out my ninth grade year. And what I thought was like a harbinger of how things are going to change. Uh, It was me and Sarah and her friend Debbie and I think Toby and Eric. And we all walked on the last day of school. We walked to Sir George's Smorgasbord across from Norwalk Square. And I bought Sarah lunch. And I remember sitting there like, oh, okay, this high school thing, I might, I might eventually figure it out. This could be a thing here. Now, I was completely wrong. Spoiler alert. I was completely wrong. But ninth grade sort of melted away. I just wanted it to end, to go away other than learning how to type, standing up to Rick, 
and bearing all as Potiphar, I didn't count the year. I went to every football game, mostly to watch the cheerleaders. That'll come into play in the next episode. Uh, But going to a dance with a girl just seems so far away. I went to a dance that year. I went to a dance that year. I went to the Sadie Hawkins dance. That's where the girl asks the guy. A girl actually asked me to go to the dance. Of course, she asked Felipe and David to go as well. So it was three guys and one girl. I have the picture to prove it. But hey, I was at a dance where a girl had asked me to go. And that was good enough for me because no one else was asking. And as I ate my green beans and mashed potatoes with Sarah on that last day of school, I thought, you know, the future is going to be a little brighter. And in some ways, the next few years were a little brighter. And in some ways, in some ways, they got a little darker. But that's life, right? That's life. Hey, thanks for tuning in to this episode. I am The Voice. I am Jeff Tucker. These are my high school memories. I hope that I didn't bore you with them. Your high school life might have been different. Maybe you were the cheerleader. Maybe you were the the popular guy. I sure wasn't. But what I am is the host of 91 Reasons. Thanks for listening to 91 Reasons. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Find us on Facebook. Is anyone even still listening?
future boy.